Well, good morning. What a beautiful morning it is. I love the fact, for some reason, my uh, headset is catching here on the back of um, my collar. Uh, great morning, beautiful morning. The sun is shining. Uh, the weather is finally warming up. It is just fantastic. Could not be a better Sunday to work outside and um, green up our church, plant some flowers, spread some mulch. Um, I heard something about breaking up concrete, so if somebody comes in particularly frustrated today, um, I think uh, we know something that you can do to work that all out, um, but a uh, wonderful day to do all of that, and, and what a great day to gather together as a church family. It is wonderful to see everybody here, including some of our diaspora members, which is what I call those who, um, who are members but then go off to other places like Cincinnati. Um, and so um, they are our members in diaspora because our family truly reaches well beyond uh, these shores. Um, we are um, in red today, um, even though I got things mixed up last week. Is I am so excited for Pentecost that, that I just, well, first of all, I also can't quite get it through my head that there are five Sundays in May for some reason. So I keep shoving the two together, the 21st and the 28th. But I love Pentecost. I, if it were up to me, we would have red on all the time, uh, and not not for the teams that you might think. Just just, but it gives me the opportunity to wear one of my favorite stoles that I don't get to wear enough. And, and it's a little bit of an unusual stole. It is truly a one of a kind. I received this when I was ordained. I was still part of the fire department in Pleasantville when I was ordained. Uh, in fact, one of the guys read at my ordination ceremony. And so as a gift, they gave me a stool, and it has the Pleasantville Fire Department emblem down at the bottom. And on the back, what's catching on my, on my headset here, it says Reverend and ex-Captain and ex Diane Carter. And so this is just so special, um, you know. So today is pre-Pentecost, uh, <laughs> or Pentecost Eve, if you prefer. Um, the truth is the Holy Spirit is an integral part of everything that we do, not only in the church, but as Christians. And so uh, celebrating the Holy Spirit can never be done too frequently or, or too often. If you would like to see how I would love to have you dressed next week, all you need to do is turn around and look in the back row because there are some who are dressed in red so that they could be models. In fact, ladies, would you stand up so that um, you know everybody can, yep, see, just like that. We love that. Carol's got a shirt on as well. I won't make her stand up. Yes, yes, thank you. Wonderful. Um, so we have a wonderful service today, um, and, uh, and nobody else has to stand up. So you can just sit down, um, relax, but I will still be listening for your voices because we are now going to join together in our opening prayer this morning. Come and learn the ways of life. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. We are yet to follow Jesus' teaching. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who persecute you. We are yet to follow Jesus' example. Jesus calls us to live as he lived. So with his words in our hearts, let us pray. God, you are the first and the last the beginning and the end of all things. We rejoice that in you all things move and have their being. And we remember that you are our source of hope. Be present in our time of worship and be present with us in every moment of our lives. 
Enable us to feel the power of your love so that we will never give up and always hope, no matter what. Amen. And now I would like the kids to come up for a very special time. Hello. Look at those butterflies. Your red dot. You've got a yellow dot. Come on. Yes, she is. Isn't that exciting? It's like a little daycare reunion up here. Hey, Braxton. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> it's okay. It's the young and young at heart. Hi, how are you? Well, we're going to do something very special today, but I'm going to need a few of, of you to help me. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay, so I know a few of you know this. So here's my question. What are the fruits of the Spirit? What, very good. Look at that hand. What, what are, name some of the fruits of the Spirit, Ryan. Charity? Oh, cherry and a lemon. Yes, yes, absolutely. Those are, those are how they learned them. Yes, you're absolutely right. Do you remember what the Bible says that they are? Yeah. Apples and grapes. Yes, absolutely. Does anybody remember what those remind us of? Kindness and joy and what else? That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> wow. That is amazing. Okay, now here's my second question. And Ryan, I'm going to let you answer this one. Yes, self control. Oh, good. How do you know that? You did it in Sunday school. Did you guys just get together and open up your Bibles and, and figure it out on your own? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, how did you um? How did you learn all that? Because that's a lot to learn. You watched it on TV in Sunday school. Did did maybe Miss K help? Yeah, and and Miss K is the teacher of Sunday school, right? Well, she taught you guys an awful lot, and I know she had a helper too, didn't she? Walter, did Walter help? Yeah. Yeah, Walter helped. And, and I know that the older kids, they learned stuff, and the adults are just glad to be done with the book of Job. <laughs> but they learned a lot too. They're just glad to be done. You know, last week we celebrated our moms, and we said how they take care of us. But you know, our teachers take care of us too, don't they? Uh, we, we know that in the classroom, our teachers take care of us. And here at church, our Sunday school teachers take care and they make sure that we learn all kinds of things like the fruit of the spirit you know i'll bet you you guys could name all those fruits i'll bet you most of the adults couldn't do that so k has taught miss k has taught you something very special just as the uh, older older kids teachers did and um and the adults learn so what do you think we should celebrate the teachers today shouldn't we because today was the last day of sunday school until we take a summer break which is a good thing to do. So would you like to celebrate all the teachers? Can you help me do that? Yeah. All right, let's invite the teachers to come up, please. We have three. So there's Miss Kay, there's Sandra, there's Dinah, and there is Faith, who is so appropriately named as a Sunday school teacher. All right, you guys come up. And, and Walter, I'm sorry, Walter. I can't believe I forgot you. Oh. All right, why don't you guys step up on this top step? Oh, sit down on the top step. <laughs> Hi. Yep. I, I will get you a sucker. Can you help me? Can you help me and, and give all of these special ladies something special? And, and dog? <laughs> Can you, 
Well, I think I will just, um, I think I will just go ahead and do this. Sure. So we have a special gift for all of our teachers. It is, it is merely a token of everything that you have given um, to, um, to all of the kids, um, uh, young and old. Um, truly, teachers do touch the future. And in this case, the future you're touching lasts for eternity. So that's very special. We all join me and let's give our teachers a big round of applause. You clap? Do you think that the teachers should get a sucker too? How about, how about you get a sucker first? Okay. Then you think we, that we should give the teachers a sucker? Okay. There's lots. I refilled them. Which one do you like, Walter? <laughs> all right and and you got to get one for okay there you go all right let's i've got some for all of you too first let's pray and let's thank god for our teachers god thank you so much for all of our teachers because without them god we probably wouldn't know as much about you as we do and as we want to we pray that you would bless them for all the time they spend, not just on Sunday mornings, but on all of the preparation. And God, we thank you for Walter, that he comes along and helps out too, because Walter speaks to all of our hearts in a way that uh, only he can. It's very special, and he helps all of us learn very special things, just like all of our teachers do. Whether our teachers are human or are canine puppets, God, we thank you for each and every one because you have put your spirit in their hearts and used them for the furtherance of your kingdom. So we pray your blessing upon them and upon all of us as we seek to grow in our knowledge and awareness and love for you, even as you love us. Jesus taught us a lot of all of this, and so it's in his name that we pray today. Amen. All right, I will let the teachers sit down and I will I'll let the teachers go this way. I will take the kids over here. Some suckers. You're welcome. Here you go. Yeah, Walter, what's what's your favorite fruit of the spirit? Apologies to those at home who did not get a chance to hear that. Uh, at this time, we have a very special blessing. Um, uh, Lori Williams is going to uh, share with us a special song. This song I thought was really appropriate because this is Ascension Sunday, when God gave us, or Jesus gave us, the commission of what we're supposed to be doing in the world, which is to spread his love and his word, then and now. So. You enjoy it. And just to say, Lori, is that on? All right, put it on. Okay. Yeah, just hold it closer. Closer, okay. Sorry. <laughs> to believe I have faith that you will do greater things it's my time to go but before I leave go tell the world about me you I've conquered 
death and I hold the keys. Where I go, you will go to someday. But, but there's much to do here before you leave. So go tell the world about me. I was dead, but now I live. I've got to go now for a little while. But goodbye not the end of the journey, the end of the road. My spirit is with you wherever you go. You have a purpose and I have a plan. Thank you so much. Uh, and of course, Wendy also thank you on accompaniment. Good morning. So the reading today is from uh, John 16 verses 25 through 33, the King James Version. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall shew you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I shall say not unto you, that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye may have, might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Word of God. Thank you, Roy. I have, I have, um, I have missed that. Roy is the only one, by the way, who really has my permission to um, read the King James Version because it sounds so amazing when he does it. <laughs> Although as we celebrated once prior, 
Congratulations, because I'm pretty sure Roy is the most recent United States citizen gathered here today. So once again, congratulations. I think we celebrated before, but it wasn't official official. Yeah. So uh, our second reading today also comes from the New Testament, looking specifically at the 17th chapter of Acts, verses 22 through 29. Paul finds himself in Athens, speaking to those there, the Athenian Christians or, and, and non-Christians alike. And uh, this is what he says to them. He stood in front of them and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made, the, God who made uh, the world and everything in it, he is who, he is who, he, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places that they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of you, in, as some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think of the deity like is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray together. God, we do give you thanks. We, we rejoice in your word because in your word is the life that we seek not simply the existence that we have in this world, but the true life that you have created us for. This is what Jesus came to reveal to us. And this is what we find in you and through your holy word. So open our hearts and spirits today, pour into us your holy word and through your Holy Spirit, enable us to not only discern your speaking to us, but also to know the way forward. We pray this in your holy name, amen. I came across one of the coolest stories this week. It was originally published in Parade Magazine. Remember that it used to come in the Sunday paper? The story was about a sixth grade class in East Harlem, New York. There were 59 students in the class and most of these students were either black or Puerto Rican as you would find even if you went to East Harlem, New York today. The seminary I went to is not too far from Harlem. And so I know as it was then, it is now, it's a rough area. I mean, you know, we didn't leave Morningside Heights. We stayed pretty much uh, where we wanted to be. And these students not only faced a, a, a rough circumstance within their lives every single day, but they faced a pretty uncertain future. And there's, there's a lot of just repeating the, the generations, repeating what the previous ones have done without a lot of hope for much of a future. The school wanted to change this cycle. And so they asked a man named Eugene Lang, whose name might not mean anything to us, but he was a self-made millionaire. He's since passed on, but he had created and, and done many, many things. And the school thought, well, maybe this guy who pulled himself up and became a millionaire on his own, not just given the money, but lived into that, maybe he might be able to impart some wisdom, some something knowledge to these students, something that they could hang on to that might maybe in, enable them to overcome the cultural pressures and difficulties that they faced each and every day. I mean, as you might imagine, there's probably just as much pressure, if not more so, to join a gang than there is to graduate from high school in East New York then and now. So Eugene Lang accepted the invitation and he started to work on what he would say, but as, as draft after draft ended up crumpled up in the corner, he began to wonder what he had gotten himself into. 
he kept thinking, what am I possibly going to share with these sixth grade kids that's, that's going to make any kind of a difference in their lives? I mean, they might hear me speak. They might be inspired in the moment, but they're still going to go back and live in East Harlem, New York. There's still going to be gunshots and murders and gang activity. There's still going to be poverty and not much hope for the future. What can I possibly do for them? Well, eventually, as is always the case, regardless of how prepared we are, the day arrived. And while Eugene Lang did have some notes carefully prepared in the breast pocket of the suit that he wore, he didn't get them out. He decided that it, as he stood in front of these 59 students, he decided he was going to scrap his notes and just speak uh, right from the heart. And what he said changed the lives of almost every single student who heard him speak today, that day. I wonder if you can guess what he told them. Parade Magazine doesn't give the entirety of his speech, but it does include the words that Mr. Lang said that made all the difference in the lives of these sixth graders. He said simply, stay in school and I'll help pay the college tuition for every one of you. It's a true story. And if you want to know how much of a difference Eugene Lang made in the lives of those students, the article also reports that nearly 90% of that class went on to graduate from high school. It's just amazing. And if you're wondering what it was about that simple statement that made a difference in the lives of the students, the article also quotes a student, unnamed, so we don't even know the gender, but the student said this. He said, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. Do you know what Eugene Lang really gave those students that day? It had nothing to do with the financial promise of helping to pay for college. It was something so much more important than that. It was something that those students didn't have. It was something that created that golden feeling, as that student said, so powerful and so necessary for each and every one of us, whether we live in East Harlem or Bellevue or wherever we are. You see, what he gave them that day was hope. And truly, hope is how he changed their lives. He gave them hope that what the circumstances were that they went home to every day was not all that they had. He gave them hope that there could be a future that was better, brighter, and mean more in their lives. He gave them hope that they could break the cycle of poverty that had been going on for generation after generation. And this is what hope does. Hope looks beyond our current circumstances and situations, and it anticipates what will be, not just what can be, but what will be, believing that whatever it is, even though we don't know, it will be good. Hope gives us something to hang on to. It truly is an anchor, and that is a big deal, not only for a bunch of sixth grade kids in New York, but for all of us. Because you see, the truth is hope is absolutely essential to each and every one of our lives. In fact, I looked up when I was researching hope and found that in a Psychology Today article, the, the author stated that hope structures your life in anticipation of the future and influences how you feel in the present. Similar to optimism, hope, hope creates a positive mood about an expectation a goal or a future situation. Just think about that. Anticipation of the future. And even more important than that, influencing how we feel in the present, giving us this sense of optimism, giving us this sense of ability to move beyond even the worst of situations because we know that there's something more, that there will be an end to what we're going through, that the circumstances we find ourselves in is not going to be the final chapter, the final verdict on our lives. It is simply where we are now. And while it might seem overwhelming and seem like it's going to last forever, hope tells us the opposite. Hope tells us that there is more. There is a future, and it's brighter and better than what we're currently living in. No wonder we talk so much about hope in the church. We find it all the way throughout the Bible because this is what God wants us to have. And when it was lacking in the Old Testament because of the barriers that sin had erected, this is what Jesus came to offer each and every one of us. 
This is what we continue to celebrate, not only all the time in the church, but in our final Sunday of the season of Easter. Because when Jesus emerged from that tomb, not only did he give us life, he gave us hope. Because it might just have been a round stone that had been rolled away, but the truth is what really rolled away or came open were the gates of heaven. All of a sudden, eternity with God was possible for each and every person. That's what Jesus came to make possible for us. That's what I share with families whenever we gather to say goodbye to a loved one. And that's what we each need every single day of our lives. We need to know that whatever it is we're living in, that there's more and that more is possible because of God's love for us. Bless you. We need to know that no matter what we've done in the past, there is always a future for us. We need to know, as Paul shared in another letter, this one to the Roman church, that nothing that we've ever done or said, even if we are openly hostile to God, literally nothing on earth or in heaven can separate us from God's love. Nothing we do now or later can ever cancel out God's love for us. In fact, it doesn't even diminish it. That's our hope. That's what we can look to. That's what literally gives us life. And that's what the people of Athens were missing. It's what Paul was referring to when he says to them, uh, I see that you are very religious. You have an altar to an unknown God. Now, Paul was being a little sarcastic here, not necessarily a characteristic that um, is always good in a teacher when you're trying to persuade people, but sometimes it does get their attention. You see, the Athenians, they were uh, religious in as much as they had a lot of gods. Athens, as you might remember from um, your school days, or perhaps now, was originally a Greek city. And while it was currently being occupied by the Romans, while Paul was speaking to them, there was plenty of Greek influence still. And many of those traditions were still held very much by the people there. And the one tradition that they had held on to was this altar to an unknown God. In fact, honestly, when I looked it up, there would have been more than one altar to an unknown God. You see, there's a legend that explains how these altars happen to come. Uh, the legend has it that um, many, many years prior, there was a terrible plague that had been in Athens. And all of the efforts that were made to appease the known gods of the Greeks, you can look those up in Greek mythology. My nephew could tell you what they all are. I know one of them is Ares because that's now the name of his bearded dragon. But aside from that, I really don't know. All of their efforts, their sacrifices, everything that they had done to appease the gods and stop the plague, it had all failed. And so one wise man, he had an idea, and he says, here's what we're going to do. There are clearly gods that we don't know about. So I'm not quite sure why the sheep were the ones that supposedly knew this thing, but he took a bunch of sheep up to the top of Mars Hill, which is local in the area, he released them, and wherever each of those sheep stopped, they erected an altar and sacrificed that sheep. Boy, if somebody had told the sheep, they would have just kept on walking, <laughs> right? Right on into Egypt. So all of these altars to unknown gods, and as you might imagine, as legend also holds, the plague ended. I doubt seriously it had anything to do with altars or sheep or sacrifices to unknown gods. And yet this was part of the Greek tradition that had carried over. It reminds me, if you've ever seen the movie, The Mummy, of the, um, the, the squirrely little guy who everybody is supposed to love to hate, who's like the henchman, the sidekick, and he's got all of these medallions around his neck, and when the mummy comes, he doesn't know what faith tradition he is, so he keeps holding each one up until the mummy reacts to one of them, and then he's saved. This is kind of what the Athenians were doing. They were hedging their bets. And so the truth is, as I said, Paul was not really commending them for their religiosity. He was actually pointing out that their faith was lacking, that they didn't even know the gods that they were supposedly worshiping. In fact, the truth is, it really wasn't religion at all. What the Athenians were practicing was far more of a superstition 
than an actual religion. And sometimes that can be difficult to discern the difference. Superstition and religion can look an awful lot like one another, but I'll tell you the true litmus test. Here's how you can tell if something is a superstition to an unknown God or to a known God or true, true religion. And that is that superstition is always fear-based. If there's any fear based in your faith or religion, then it's not from our God. Because God came to in Jesus to cancel out fear. That's what faith does. True religion, as Jesus shares in it, is based on faith, love, and hope. This is what Paul wanted the Athenians to know. It's why he was a little bit sarcastic, why he called them out and their unknown God. He wanted to jolt them awake so that they could realize that there was something more than what they were doing. These superstitions of going through the motions and trying to appease gods. Paul had to have blown their minds with what he told them because he told them about a God who doesn't need to be appeased, doesn't even need to be served as all of the Greek and Roman gods constantly demanded from the people. No, in fact, God's, Paul shares with them about a God who created all that is. And not only does God not need to be served by human hands, but God serves us. God cares for us, protects us, watches over us, and makes that better future, that hope possible for each and every one of us. We don't need to appease God. God is all that is. And so their gods operated on their own agendas and whims. The God that Jesus revealed and that Paul was revealing to the Athenians is a God who operates out of love, love for the people. And if you ever doubt that this is true, all you have to do is look at the cross because it was God's love for all of us that motivated God to send Jesus to the world and then to the cross. This is not a mere superstition. There is no fear in any of this. There is only love and only hope. Just imagine what the Athenians must have thought when they heard about this kind of a possibility. I dare say there was nothing like any of this in Greek culture or in Roman life. This was something entirely new. It was about hope. In a sense, Paul was trying to offer them the same thing that Eugene Lang was trying to offer to those sixth grade students. He was trying to let them know that in the true God, not an unknown God, but the true God that Jesus has come to reveal to us, there is hope. There is also peace and love. There is something that we can stake our futures on regardless of what our presence in, in the moment looks like. There is something that we can hold on to through the storms of life something that we can trust in, even when we can't see our way forward. All of this is what Paul was trying to share with the Athenians in those few sentences that I read for you, because he cared about them. He wanted them to know this hope, the same hope that Jesus came to share with each and every one of us. The hope that again reminds us that God's love for us is so great that we can never move beyond it, never do anything that causes us to lose it. It will always be there for each and every one. And now, because Jesus is offering that to us, and hopefully we have received it, now we have a call on this commissioning Sunday to go out and share it with others. You know, hope is so important in our lives. I'm literally not overstating this if I say that hope is as important to our lives as breath. In fact, what breath is to our physical bodies, hope is to our emotional and our spiritual beings. You literally cannot live without hope. When I was taking my CPR class, I had a, um, a, a faith-based instructor and the person said, you know, I'm gonna teach you the rule of threes. And I know those who are nurses here, don't correct me on this, it's close enough. But they said, you can, you can roughly live for 30 days without food, three days without water, and three minutes without oxygen. But he said, you can't live for even three fractions of a second without hope. Hope is our spiritual breath. 
And it is spiritual because it comes from God. God is the source of our hope, which makes this hope even stronger and more powerful than what Eugene Lang offered to those sixth grade students. It's not merely a promise of financial assistance for college. It's a promise of eternal life. It's a promise of love overcoming. It's a promise of knowing God as God's own children. It's a promise of everything because that's what God has created us for. That's what Jesus came to restore and to reveal to us. And that's what we can claim in this hope. And that's what we're being called to share with others. You see, Jesus did come to reveal God to us and to reveal the hope that we have in God, but it wasn't just for ourselves alone. This is such a great treasure. We are never supposed to keep it to ourselves alone. We are supposed to do like Jesus talked about with the light and let it shine and share it with others. The best news is it doesn't take preaching in a pulpit or on a street corner. It merely comes by living your lives in such a way that the hope that you have in tomorrow shines forth today. Because I guarantee you, we live in a world that is desperate for hope. And if people start to see it evidenced in your life, you will not need to say a word to them. They will come to you and want to know how it is that you can get through this situation or that circumstance. How it is that you can still smile in the midst of devastation. How it is that you can even get out of bed not knowing what's going to happen later on in the day or worse yet, knowing what will likely happen later on in the day. Hope makes all of this possible. And so as we are able to live in this ourselves, and to truly receive what Jesus has come to offer us, let us also resolve to share it with others. Because truly, if you think that one man's words changed the lives of 90% of a sixth grade class, just imagine what the words of the Son of God can do in our world. Truly, you want the kingdom in this world as we pray for and will pray for in a little bit? That's how we do that. Share that hope. Let that lift people out of the darkness and despair and into the light of God's loves and promises. Amen. And now as we leave this place, I pray we do so even walking into an unknown future that we walk forward with hope, knowing that wherever our path leads, God is already there. Jesus is walking right alongside of us and the Holy Spirit is within us making sure every step falls where it needs to as we are willing to follow. Let us go forward into the world with hope. Amen. Mm -hmm.